Thank you for uh, watching this video. My name is uh, James Carrion. I am an independent researcher with a keen interest in Cold War history as well as intelligence history. And uh, I want to present um, a hy hypothesis for why flying saucers made all the headlines uh, in newspapers in 1947. Uh, I believe that these uh, flying saucers were part of a Cold War deception operation. And uh, I believe that this is a, a counterintelligence focused operation. And uh, this counterintelligence hypothesis is that these flying, flying saucer stories were purposely planted in the US press uh, as part of this uh, strategic deception against the Soviet Union to assist in breaking the Soviet diplomatic code. So very uh, <clears throat> similar to what the British did during World War II when they broke the German Enigma code, this is uh, the Americans breaking the Soviet diplomatic code. So uh, I'm gonna try to show that this hypothesis is supported uh, through artificial intelligence and uh, AI-driven analysis um, at the end of this uh, presentation. And I just want to make very clear that this hypothesis is focusing on a very specific time frame in history, specifically from June to August of 1947. So it does not pretend to provide any answers for any UFO or UAP events that occurred prior to that time or anything that occurred after that time. So to understand the hypothesis, it's important to understand the state of Soviet espionage in the United States in 1947. So in the US, we had uh, a number of KGB agents that were operating under diplomatic or other cover. Uh, we had uh, GRU, which is the military intelligence branch um, that was operating under diplomatic or other cover. And then we had Soviet illegal uh, intelligence agents that were secretly living among the population. In 1945, um, the years prior to 47, was a pivotal year for American counterintelligence because it was that year that we heard from Elizabeth Bentley when she told the FBI about her extensive Soviet espionage activity. And we heard from uh, Igor Gauzenko, a Soviet code clerk who defected in Canada. And between the two of them, they revealed that there was this vast network of Soviet spies in the US and in Canada. So the Americans realized the counterintelligence threat that was on their doorstep and uh, what happened was that the Soviet spy masters, uh, after the defection of Bentley and Gauzenko, ordered their KGB and GRU agents to freeze all contact with their agents because the FBI was shadowing them, making it next to impossible to uh, recruit new assets or get in contact with existing assets. And uh, this forced these KGB and GRU agents to have to rely on the US media as their primary source of reportable intelligence in 1947. Now, if there was something that showed up in the media that was of intelligence value, there were two options to get that information to Moscow securely. They could uh, take it down to their local telegraph office and they could send it as enciphered telegrams to Moscow. This was restricted to things that were of urgent intelligence, things that had to be communicated quickly. Um, and if there was something that could wait or was too bulky to send through uh, enciphered telegraphs, the Soviet agents would drop it into a diplomatic pouch and that diplomatic pouch would be put on a plane or on a boat and couriered back to Moscow, which obviously took time. So intelligence or urgent intelligence would be um, sent over telegrams. And there, <clears throat> these three companies, uh, RCA, Western Union, and ITT, turns out had a special relationship with the US government where they were sending copies of all telegrams, both inbound and outbound, uh, to the American code breaking agencies under what was called Project Shamrock. And at that time, this was not the National Security Agency, NSA did not exist. These were the predecessor, predecessor organizations of the Army Security Agency and Navy Op 20G. So <clears throat> um, the way this worked is 
uh, the, both the KGB and the GRU use the same code, diplomatic code, that the normal, normal uh, Soviet embassy personnel did. Um, and there was three layers of security to this code. There was a cover name, cover name layer where rather than include in their messages the real names of assets, they would use cover names instead. So, for example, infamous atomic spy Julius Rosenberg was given cover name Liberal or Antenna, and he was referenced by those cover names in any communication going back and forth to Moscow. The atomic scientist and spy Klaus Fuchs was given the cover name of Rest or Charles. Same thing applied. And uh, even locations were given cover names, like San Francisco was assigned the cover name Babylon, and the Manhattan Project was assigned the cover name Enormous. <clears throat> so after obfuscating the names of locations, people, and projects, they would then write their messages out and then encode them using uh, what's called a code book, where it, they would find the Russian words they wanted to put in the message, and each Russian word would have a four-digit code, and they would write down that code as part of the message. And then those codes, those four-digit codes, would then uh, themselves be obfuscated by an enciphering layer, which was applied uh, through what's called a one-time pad, which I'll explain in just a bit. So three layers of security to the Soviet diplomatic code. So let's start off with the Soviet code book. So the Soviet code book was basically a dictionary of 10,000 words uh, for 10,000 different Russian words. And so when I write, wanted to write out a message in Russian, I would find its code equivalent in the code book, write that down uh, as a four digit code uh, and do the same thing for the other words and the message I'm trying to send. And if there was a particular word that did not exist in the code book as one of these 10,000, what I would do is spell it out letter by letter using something called the spell table. So the spell table was sort of an appendix to the code book where you could uh, spell out any word that was not included in the 10,000 entries by starting off the spelling with a start spell encoding 7810, and uh, then use the two digit codes for each letter to, actually, to do the actual spelling. Those could be Latin characters or even Russian characters, and then we would end the spelling with the end spell group, which was 91. So pretty much anything could be represented between the actual words that were in the code book plus the spell table, as long as you spelled out each word. So <clears throat> that was the code book. And the code book, you know, there could be multiple, or obviously multiple copies. So if there were uh, 100 KGB agents wandering around the United States, each would have the same code book. Um, but what they would have differently from each other was what's called one-time pads. And it was the one-time pads that were used to apply the enciphering layer to outgoing messages. So you can think of a one-time pad as just uh, a loose uh, leaf binder of a bunch of pages, and on those pages are uh, rows and columns of five-digit code groups that, that are randomly selected and printed, uh, and that was used as the key, the additive key that would then encipher uh, the outgoing message before it was delivered to the telegraph companies. Now, the thing about a one-time pad system is that uh, this is perfect encryption in that it's mathematically proven to be unbreakable as long as you follow the basic rules of a one-time pad, which is each one-time pad should only exist as a single pair where one pad is given to the sender, the other one to the receiver. And as long as you stick to that and uh, when you use up a pad page on a message, you destroy it and you don't reuse it again, then it's theoretically an unbreakable code. Uh, even today, there's no amount of computing power, either quantum or classical, that can break uh, a one-time pad system that is properly used. So the way that uh, this would work is that, let's say, for example, uh, I'm a KGB agent and uh, I had my contact, William Ullman, who I gave the cover name Pilot. Um, he delivered to me a report about rockets and I want to report that back to Moscow. So I read out a message, pilot delivered report about rockets, and pilot was the cover name for my asset. I didn't, so I didn't include his real name in there. So I would go to my code book, and I would find, obviously, the Russian equivalent for each of these words, find the corresponding code in the dictionary for that, 
I would write down those four digit codes to create the uh, encoding layer. Then I would have to convert those four digits into five digits. And the way I did that was I simply borrowed um, for the first four digit code group, I would borrow one of the digits from the, from the group to the right. So the, the number two there that you see from the word delivered would be borrowed and put into the five digit code group for the word pilot. And I would keep borrowing until um, I have um, all five digit groups. So I'm converting from four digits to five digits. Then I would encipher that by taking my one time pad and find the next available page. And I would find the very first uh, code group on that page. And I would write that down and that would become the indicator uh, group. Um, and that was important because when the message was received at the other end, it would tell the code clerk which uh, pad page to look at when it was when he was trying to decipher the message. So that was actually sent out in clear text for a period of time. Uh, then I would take uh, from my one time pad the second and subsequent groups and write those under the five digits from my encoded groups. And then I take the encoding groups and the one time pad page groups and I would add them together digit by digit uh, using addition without carry. So addition without carry uh, for example, if we look at the last code group where the six from the word about is being added to the nine from the one time pad group, nine and six, nine plus six equals 15. I would write down five as the result, but I wouldn't carry the one over to the next column. So it's addition without carry. Uh, and I would do that for each individual digit uh, until I have my final a set of results at the bottom, which you see in yellow, and that became the enciphered message. And that's what I would transmit through telegraph back to Moscow. Now, as long as that pad that you see there on the left, on the bottom left, as long as that existed only as one pair, in other words, I had a copy of it, and the guy in Moscow had a copy of it, and nobody else in the world, and as long as I destroyed that page after I used it, didn't reuse it, then this code that you see here, this enciphered message you see here, is completely unbreakable. Uh, no amount of computing in the world could break that code. It was a perfect, perfect encryption. Now, when the uh, code clerk in Moscow received my enciphered message, which is what you see at the top there, um, he could decipher it by just going through a reverse process. So the first thing he would look at is that the first five-digit group there, that 14358 that you see in blue, because that's the indicator group, and that would tell him to look at his one-time pad and find the pad page where that was the first five-digit group. And when he found that pad page, he would then write down the groups after that underneath the enciphered message, which you see in green there. And this time, uh, in the reverse process, he wouldn't do add without carry, he would do subtract without borrowing, where um, each digit in the um, from the uh, one-time pad was subtracted without borrowing from each digit from the enciphered message, uh, giving us a set of results. And then those results would be converted from uh, their five-digit form to their four-digit form by moving the uh, uh, digits to the right uh, until you have the, the four-digit groups exposed. And then from there, he would take those four-digit groups and look each group up in his code book, the dictionary he has, find the corresponding word, write it down, and he would have the uh, resulting message that I, as the KGB agent in New York, sent to him. So pilot delivered report about rockets. Now, this was an ingenious system because it was perfect encryption, plus it was super easy to do. It was math that uh, a four-year-old could do. So again, um, if the one-time pad system was properly um, used, then it would be unbreakable. But it turned out that the Soviets, specifically the KGB, screwed up big time. And during the war, uh, they printed a number of these one-time pads. Rather than as a single pair, they printed them as two pairs. So they basically printed four copies of each uh, one-time pad. Now, this led 
to a scenario where you could have, for example, a KGB agent in New York using uh, the same one-time pad that a KGB agent in San Francisco was using, and they're both sending messages back to Moscow where the corresponding code clerks were deciphering them. And uh, this is a major screw up because it's, it's a no-no in a one-time pad system. It basically makes these enciphered messages exploitable. And that's exactly what the Americans did. They figured out pretty early on in 1943 that the KGB had screwed up and had created these uh, double uh, pairs of pad pages or pads and uh, they organized a project which eventually became known as the Venona Project to exploit that. Now, they realized the KGB screw up because uh, as they were getting messages copied to them by, uh, by Project Shamrock, they noticed that, for example, a KGB agent in New York sending message A um, and a KGB agent in San Francisco sending message B, both messages had the first five digits the same. And because those were the uh, first five digits from a specific pad page, that tell, told them that these messages were what we call in depth, where it, it was uh, basically a, a double pair of pads in use, which is again, a major no-no in, in cryptography. So they knew they had the ability to exploit these. The question is, how did they exploit them? And that was a complicated uh, process. So let's talk about the exploitation. So the way the exploitation would start off is the American cryptologists would, or cryptanalysts would take message A, which is enciphered, right? They didn't know what it meant. And message B, which was enciphered, again, they didn't know what it meant. But if they took those two messages and they lined them up one on top of the other, and then they subtracted one from the other, again, without borrowing, that produced a set of numerical results, what we call differencing results. And those different results, uh, also are useful because they represent uh, from the encoding layer of a message the uh, the difference between the two the, the message a encoding groups and the message b encoding groups so effectively and i'll explain that a little further but effectively what they what they've done by having these two messages in depth and adding them together to uh, create these uh, or subtracting them from each other and getting the, the differencing results is they've effectively stripped off the layer of encipherment so that they can figure out what the underlying codebook groups they are. So if we look at it from the point of view here, where message A, uh, you're seeing the code groups, not the encipherment layer, but the encoding layer, the, the, the digits that came from the uh, codebook in their four digit form, um, message A and message B, the differencing results uh, were basically uh, represented the, uh, the difference between those two sets of groups. So message A, the first code group was 79342. Um, if message B, code group 78102, was subtracted from it without borrowing, um, then it, it, it actually matched the differencing result. So uh, that, that's where the importance of those different results, uh, where they came into play. Now, so it, it turns out that uh, having the differencing results um, is important in exploiting the code. But if we look at it from this perspective, uh, we know the differencing results, but it, we don't really know what the code groups are for message A or message B uh, because there are 100,000 different possible combinations for each group that could result in the same differencing result. So, um, there was 100,000 different possible combinations of the first code group for A that when um, uh, subtracted from uh, the code group of, from, from, from B would result in 0, 1, 2, 4, 0, 100,000 different ways to do that. So that wasn't really useful. So we, in order to actually exploit this, we have to figure out a way to either know specifically what message B's encoding groups are or message A's encoding groups are, so we could use the differencing result to then find the other messages encoding group. So how would the uh, Americans do that? So I'll explain um, how it is we can derive the encoding groups knowing one or the other. Uh, but before I do that, I wanted to point out something about the, the code book itself. 
And that is, um, remember I told you the code book has 10,000 entries in it and there was a separate appendix for the spell tables. Well, the Americans had already figured out what the spell tables, what the spell table was in 1946. So they already knew that uh, the, the, the encoded group 7810 meant start spell and the 91 group ended, uh, uh, meant end the spelling. And they knew that the letter A in Latin had a uh, encoding group of 10 and so on. This they figured out. So this was an, a, a known part of the code book. The problem is that they didn't know the rest of the code book. They knew there were 10,000 entries in it uh, because Igor Gauzenko told them that, but they didn't know exactly what uh, for each entry, for each code group, what the corresponding Russian word was. Word was. So they were starting off from a clean slate, and they basically, uh, in order to exploit uh, through the Monona project these uh, the Soviet diplomatic code, they would have to recreate this entire Soviet code book of 10,000 entries out of thin air. And it turned out that by 1946 they had recreated 3.5 percent of it. By August of 47 they had recreated 15 percent of it. But then by 1948 there was this rapid acceleration where they recovered up to 90% of the code book. Um, and the question is, how were they able to do that? Um, how were they able to advance the breaking of the, of the code book or the filling in of the code book so rapidly between 46 and 48? So let's talk about that. In order to be able to uh, actually uh, come up with the, the underlying encodings and then mapping them to something in, in the code book, the uh, cryptographers needed like a Rosetta Stone, something that would help them <coughs> uh, be able to, to, uh, to figure this out. And um, they, they used uh, something called collateral to do that. Now collateral is what we call cribs in a message. So it could be, for example, that they knew that, that let's say some of the messages, maybe message A or message B, because of the source of where it's coming from, maybe they knew that the person that was encoding the message always started off the message with the date. So if they knew the date, then they could use that to uh, try to figure out what the other coding groups were for, for the message that was in depth. Or it could be that the, uh, the crib was the same greeting each time, greetings comrade. If they knew that was the start of the message, they could try to use that as a breaking point. Or they could have used just stolen cryptographic material. Uh, allegedly, the FBI stole a bunch of enciphered messages in their plain text and handed them off to uh, the American cryptographers uh, to be used as collateral. But there's one other source that the NSA is completely mute on and never talks about, and that is using what's called gardening as collateral. And gardening is uh, where you plant text you know your adversary is going to send an enciphered message because you know if they encipher it, then, and you know what the, the plain text is, then you can use that uh, when you're trying to figure out the messages that are in depth to that one, uh, its corresponding encoding groups. So this was something that the Brits used during World War II to break Enigma and the Americans used in the Battle of Midway. And it's this third method of collateral, uh, where it's called gardening, that I believe was the source for these flying saucer stories that were planted in the press for that express purpose. Now, for this scheme to work, the KGB and GRU would have to would have to see those flying saucer stories as urgent intelligence that they would then send through enciphered telegrams and not by dropping them in the diplomatic pouch and sending them over on a ship or on a plane. And uh, I believe that the flying saucers were considered urgent intelligence in 1947. Uh, because it was around the same time that Stalin was having an anxiety attack uh, because the Russians did not have the atomic bomb in 1947 and he was hyper interested in developing advanced uh, aerial weapons uh, like bombers or missiles and uh, he organized a conference in 1947 where he, he gathered his top aeronautical engineers and tasked them with doing just that. Well, it was soon after April 47 that we start seeing show up in the American press hints that the Americans had already beaten him to the punch and that they were already developing those weapons that he so desired. Uh, in June, mid-June of 1947, there was a series of newspaper articles talking about a uh, top secret weapons project that the Americans had 
that was bigger than the atomic bomb. And uh, it received a lot of press attention uh, and it was bandered around in the press. And eventually journalists thought maybe it was an aerial weapon because the scientist who worked on it was an expert in aeronautics. Well, after doing some research um, in 2009, I found out that this newspaper uh, story on the super weapon was a real top secret project called Project SEAL. And it was a wonder weapon, but it was not an airborne weapon. It was actually uh, the Americans and the New Zealanders were experimenting with uh, creating artificial tsunamis by using underwater explosives. And I found the declassified report uh, for Project Seal, which was declassified in the 50s, and it named the scientists that would match the ones that were in the newspaper, uh, the American scientist James Marion Snodgrass and the New Zealander scientist Thomas David James Leach. So they were real people. They did work on this top secret project, this Project Seal, but it was being misrepresented in the press as an airborne weapon when in fact it was no such thing. But even more importantly, this project was actually killed off in 1945. And it was being promoted as active by these two scientists in 1947. So that was a hint that there was some level of strategic deception going on where we were trying to convince the Russians that we had uh, airborne weapons that they did not have. Well, that was soon followed up a week later by the very first flying saucer story when Kenneth Arnold had his famous sighting of UFOs near Mount Rainier, uh, the flying saucer, uh, the nine flying saucers that he saw. And from there, it just went viral around the world. And soon the uh, headlines across every newspaper in America had to do with flying saucers. And that did not abate uh, until August of 47. And in between there, we see the Roswell uh, press release and retraction and so flying saucers were the major topic of the day during this time. Now, all of these, Amer these flying saucer stories and the Snodgrass super weapon of Project Seal, that would have sent Stalin in panic mode, right? Because he was already craving having advanced aerial weapons in April of 47. He didn't have an atomic bomb he could use. So if he believed the Americans had already achieved these miraculous aerial weapons, he would have tasked all his agents in the U.S to send all of the related information they could find back to Moscow via Encyclopedia telegraphs. Um, and we know that the, the same agents, their primary source of intelligence was the US media. So planting stories in the press made complete sense. So this was a feedback loop that was ripe for gardening, um, where the Russians were sending their uh, in, in their urgent intelligence back via cipher telegrams, and the American code breakers were getting copies of those through Project Shamrock. And historians know that the Russians, uh, Russian agents were being shadowed day and night by the FBI. They could not recruit new sources, so they were relying entirely on the U.S. media for their intelligence. So how could the media be exploited uh, for these flying saucer newspaper articles to be planted? Well, um, you didn't have to recruit individual newspaper editors. All they had to do was recruit the heads of the press agencies. So back then, there was the Associated Press, the United Press, the International News Service. Those were the three major press associations. Uh, this gentleman here, James Forrestal, who was Secretary of the Navy and the first Secretary of Defense, um, he was the champion behind Project Shamrock. So when those telegraph companies were sending uh, copies of their messages to the code breakers, they went to Forrestal and they were, um, they, they, they said to Forrestal, hey, we're, we're concerned that we're doing something illegal here. And he convinced them to keep doing it, saying he had their back, not to worry about it. So he was the champion behind uh, Project Shamrock. And he was also very much, uh, had very close connections to the heads of the press associations. Uh, and he could convince them, which are these three gentlemen here, uh, the head of the AP, the UP, and the INS, uh, for them to use their, uh, their press associations for planting those articles, the flying saucer articles. Now, if they were going to plant these texts, uh, it would have been important, as I'll show in just a bit, that they would maximize the use of anglicized names in the text. And the reason for that is because if these KGB and GRU agents were going to take these uh, newspaper articles and report them back as intelligence, then the more anglicized names that were in there that they did not have a Russian corresponding word for, the more they would have to use the spell table 
uh, to spell it out. And since the spell table encoding groups were known already to the American cryptographers, that would help them then guess what the encoding groups were from the other messages in depth. So that would help them uh, cryptanalytically uh, exploit more of the, uh, of the Venona uh, telegraph messages. In addition to planting anglicized names, they could also plant known cover names of uh, different, or at least what was on the, the radar of counterintelligence at that time, different Soviet agents, uh, because then they could possibly get matches uh, as well to those cover names. So the use of the spell table in this scheme was essential, and, and let me explain why. So take a look, for example, at this flying saucer article on the left from 1947. And at the bottom, I've highlighted some of the uh, flying saucer witnesses that we're reporting on. And notice that they, for some reason, three of these guys all have the same first name. Kenneth Rogers, uh, Kenneth Wolkschlager, and Kenneth Lorkey. Um, so if a KGB agent took that and said, oh, let me send this back to Moscow and put those names in there, they would have to spell out the word Kenneth three times. Now, if you look at the top of the slide here, you'll notice that uh, the way they would do that is they would take the spell table, they would start off with the code group for start spell, and then the two digit group groups for each uh, letter for the name Kenneth, and then end it with N spell. They'd have to do that three times in their message because they would also put in the last name. Um, and if we take that single uh, example there and we stretch out those code groups into their five digit equivalents, um, that would mean if I had, if it was message B that was the planted message, the one where this uh, newspaper article was being enciphered, and that was in depth with message A, which may be some real intelligence that the other intelligence that, that the Russians were sending, then knowing the different results would let me would get to me to the encoding groups for message A as well. So that was the beauty of this uh, of this scheme, uh, is that the more anglicized names I could plant, and the more that those would show up in enciphered text, the more the more I could guess what the other uh, encoding groups are were for the messages that were in depth for the planted messages. All right. So now let's talk about the. Uh, that all sounds like a very good theory, uh, but where's the proof to it? Uh, obviously, there are no declassified records, either on the American side or the Russian side, that this took place. Um, so with the lack of uh, the uh, classified record, um, I decided to look at uh, doing some AI-driven analysis to see if I can come up with some, um, some hits here, something that would tell me that there is something to this theory. So I started off by taking... Um, as many flying saucer, flying saucer press stories as I could from June to July 1947. So these are AP, UP, and INS stories. And I transcribed them into separate files. I then had artificial intelligence, uh, an AI called Grok, uh, generate for me uh, 10,000 additional newspaper articles where I told it, hey, pretend you're a 1947 American cryptologist and your target is Soviet intelligence. I want you to create uh, a news article that's 400 words or less, that's uh, crypto uh, gardening optimized. And um, I had to do this 10,000 times. So I came up with 10,000 different plausible newspaper articles. And I did it again, except this time I said, you're a newspaper reporter and just create some uh, mundane news articles. And, and the reason I'm creating all this data is because I want to use it as a point of comparison against the flying saucer stories. So this was my data set. So here, for example, is or this is an example of a crypto garden optimized uh, newspaper article that that Grok created. Uh, and if you were to read through this, you would say, yeah, I can see this being reported in 1947. It used the language from 1947, uh, some of the figures from 1947. Uh, so it sounded like a plausible 1947 newspaper article, except it was crypto analytically optimized. And did the same thing for the mundane news article. Here's another example. Again, this is a plausible news story. So we have 20,000 uh, sample articles to use for comparison. So then I actually got to the analysis part. Now, on the analysis, um, I did letter frequency anomaly analysis. So uh, in any given text, uh, 
any English character should be ex can be expected to be used a certain a number of times. Some letters are used more frequently than others. But if there's a letter that's used more frequently than expected, well, that would be considered anomalous. So I had my, my anomaly script look at all the individual letters um, and tell me whenever a letter was used three times or more than its normal expected frequency. Because that, and that was reported as an anomaly. I also wanted it to um, then search for any known cover name. So I found from John Earl Haynes, who was a Venona researcher, he compiled uh, a large number, I think it was over 8,000 uh, Soviet cover names that were recovered either through uh, the Venona uh, project declassification records or from other sources. And I wanted it to be able to uh, search that and compare that to my text to see if it could find any matches. Now, I did not do bigram and trigram analysis because um, when newspaper articles uh, would be, before they would be sent uh, by the Russians to Moscow, they would have been translated from English to Russian, which would have rendered uh, any bigram or trigram analysis mute. <clears throat> okay, so let's start off with the letter frequency anomalies. So what you're seeing here is that here are my three data sets. I have the garden data on the left, non-garden in the middle, and the saucer data on the right. And uh, for, it's reporting across all 20,000 of the garden and not garden. And of course, I only have a small subset of flying saucer texts. There's only 280 files of those. But you'll, you're, no, you're gonna notice that it's detecting far more um, uh, letter, anom letter frequency anomalies in the flying saucer text than it is in the uh, AI created text. And that is very odd. That is statistically significant. Now, if we look at the next slide, we're going to see that that holds true even when I, uh, I uh, compare the same number of files. So here we're looking at 208 files from each data set, and it still holds true that the uh, flying saucer text have a larger number of letter frequency anomalies. Now, why would that be? Well, the letter frequency anomalies may be because these texts were planted. They were, they were optimized for cryptanalytic attack. If we look at the letter frequency anomaly distributions, the letter J and the letter Z have the highest number of hits. I thought maybe the letter J uh, had a higher number because I was I was transcribing news, flying saucer newspaper articles from June and July, so I thought maybe having the dates in there would uh, skew that. But even after taking out the months, the, the, the months of June and July, the words June and July, we're still seeing the same uh, number of anomalies, letter frequency anomalies. If we look at the Soviet cover name analysis, uh, we can take known cover names in 1947, like for example, a, a cover name for a Russian agent named Alice. And uh, the planted text, as long as it has those characters in there, didn't have to be uh, a complete match. Like for example, the word North Wales, uh, if, if encoded, uh, those last four characters would, would, could match to another message uh, for where the real cover name Alice was being used. And, uh, or it could be for you know, an agent like cover name Frank or cover name Dick and um, find a hit by taking the flying saucer witnesses and uh, making some of those match. And it didn't even have to be known cover names. It could be just suspected spies in 1947. This gentleman here is uh, Sir uh, Robert Hollis, uh, Roger Hollis, I'm sorry. And he it was the uh, director general of MI5, which is basically the equivalent of the FBI. He was suspected of being a Russian spy in 1947. So uh, if the Americans knew that, they could have planted in the flying saucer text uh, his name, either his first name or last name or both, and to see if there were any hits to corresponding uh, messages that were in depth. Now, when I ran my first analysis, I took from the Haynes index the 8,417 cover names that were his, in his index, and I had it search through all my flying saucer articles, and I found 196 matches. Now, that is not statistically significant, but this search here was just for proper names. When I expand the search to uh, more than just proper names, like to locations, 
Because remember the cover names uh, that the Russians used were more than just for the names of people. It could also be used for places like San Francisco, which was Babylon, or for projects like the Manhattan Project, which was enormous. Uh, then I got a, a significant more um, number of hits uh, to the point it became significantly st or statistically significant. But I ran this analysis across all three um, data sets, and it eventually became significantly st uh, statistically significant for all three. But for the flying saucer uh, data, the real flying saucer data, it hits statistical significance quicker, which in itself is telling. So, because any large enough corpus of text will eventually show statistical significance, but in the case of the flying saucer data, it achieved that significance uh, much more quicker than it did for the other two corpora of text. So it shows the strongest effects with the uh, pattern of name matches um, to the uh, cover names index. So, what are the conclusions? Um, in order for this scheme to have worked, the planting of flying saucer newspaper articles for the purpose of, of assisting in the break of the Soviet diplomatic code, there would already have to be an intelligence loop, feedback loop that existed in 1947 that in fact did happen. We know that because um, uh, his, historians have shown that Soviet agents in the US were forced to use the American telegraph companies to transmit their urgent intelligence. And these were copied to American cryptographers or cryptologists and um, these same cryptologists could have purposely planted in the American press via the Press Association's articles of extreme intelligence value to the Soviets, like the Flying Saucer newspaper articles or the Snodgrass Superweapon article. And then, um, then the analysis, the AI-driven analysis, is showing specifically that there are significant letter frequency anomalies and cover name matches uh, anomalies in the Flying Saucer text that could represent um, planted text that was optimized for cryptanalytic attack. Uh, much further research is warranted, but I encourage anybody who's interested in this research to get in contact with me, and I'll be happy to, to both provide the data set I use as well as the scripts that I use for performing the analysis. So for more details on my independent research, um, you can download two freely available books. One is on the... Um, for the 1947 Flying Saucer Summer, I wrote a book called The Roswell Deception, which documents a lot of my research, freely downloadable from this link, uh, or you can just Google for it. And also uh, for the previous year, the 1946 Ghost Rockets, I wrote a book called Anachronism, also freely downloadable. So I appreciate your time. Thank you for uh, bearing with me. And um, I hope that uh, this was uh, of use to you. And uh, Hope it made sense. Uh, please reach out to me with any comments. Thank you.